most significant moments in our entire city's history. Minneapolis braces for the George Floyd murder trial with jury selection starting this morning. We're live in the Twin Cities. Royal bombshells from talk of wanting to take her own life to accusations of concerns over their child's skin color. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry unleash a torrent of details, including the sex of their expectant baby. It's a girl. As many places race to lift restrictions, our Steve Patterson goes deep inside two states that share a border but have approached COVID management very differently. The NBA pulled out all the stops possible as they made the most of All-Star Weekend. And the big hitter did not disappoint at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Bryson DeChambeau drove for show and putt for dough. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Minneapolis is on edge this morning as the trial of Derek Chauvin gets underway. Jury selection begins in just a few hours for the former police officer accused of killing George Floyd. Floyd's death in police custody sparked international outcry and city officials fear that the trial could set off a new wave of unrest. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Minneapolis with the latest. Gabe, good morning. Philip, good morning. This is the most highly anticipated murder trial involving a police officer in recent memory, and Minneapolis is a city on edge. Barricades surround the Minneapolis courthouse, where jury selection is set to begin for the murder trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer who prosecutors say knelt on George Floyd's neck for about nine minutes. We need to get to a point of healing in our city. Mayor Jacob Fry and other city officials have been preparing for months hoping to avoid last summer's violent unrest. This is perhaps the most significant moment in our entire city's history. Felonis Floyd says he's dreading re-watching the video of his brother's death in court. Blood was coming from his nose and the officer still sat there on his neck like it was okay. It's never okay to hurt somebody like that. We shouldn't have to go to court for anything like this. Chauvin is charged with second-degree murder and manslaughter. His attorney is declining to comment, but has previously said in court filings that Floyd endangered officers by resisting arrest. In August, three other officers are scheduled to stand trial on aiding and abetting charges. The lawyer for rookie officer Thomas Lane points to toxicology reports that suggest Floyd had fentanyl and methamphetamine in his system when he died. One of the huge issues in this case is George Floyd's use of drugs. Do you believe that George Floyd's drug use contributed to his death? Absolutely, it contributed. It's a controversial defense, drawing outrage from Floyd's family and their supporters who took to the street. The fact that George Floyd was living, breathing, talking, walking just fine until Derek Chauvin put his knee on George Floyd's neck. That's all the evidence in the world to justify these officers being held accountable. On Friday, an appeals court ruled that a judge must reconsider a third-degree murder charge against Chauvin, which prosecutors are asking for. Right now, it's unclear how that will play out, but city officials are planning for jury selection to continue as scheduled later today. Philip. All right, Gabe, thank you. Let's turn now to the fallout from that explosive interview that shed new light on royal drama. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle didn't hold back during their talk with Oprah Winfrey. The couple opened up about the pressure of being under the microscope and how they were treated by Buckingham Palace. Let's bring in NBC's Ralph Sanchez, who joins us now from London. And Ralph, what were some of the biggest revelations we heard from Harry and Meghan? Francis Philip, good morning. Let's start with the good news. We knew that Harry and Meghan were expecting a second child. We now know that second child is a girl, so that's a little sister for baby Archie. The couple also revealed three days before that fairy tale wedding at Windsor Castle, the one millions of us around the world watched, they actually got married in secret in their backyard, just the two of them and their priest. Of course, what's getting much more attention here in the UK and around the world are the painful parts of this. Meghan spoke at length about feeling unprotected and unsupported by the royal family in the face of that very intense media scrutiny. She said she felt very vulnerable and at times she had suicidal thoughts. The couple also talked race. They said when Meghan was pregnant with Archie, an unnamed royal insider spoke to Harry and expressed concern about how dark the baby's skin would be. Take a listen. 
in those months when I was pregnant, all around this same time, so we have in tandem the conversation of he won't be given security, he's not gonna be given a title, and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? Look, I was really ashamed to say it at the time and ashamed to have to admit it to Harry, especially, um, because I know how much loss he suffered. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I didn't say it, that I would do it. And I, I just didn't, I just didn't want to be alive anymore. We mainly heard from Meghan during this interview, but Harry did talk about the momentous decision to break away from the royal family. He said at one point his father, Prince Charles, actually stopped taking his calls, but that he basically felt he had no choice but to do this to protect himself, to protect his wife, and to protect his child. Now, I should say, we reached out to Buckingham Palace for their response to this interview. We haven't yet heard back. British media reported the Queen was not planning to watch the interview herself, but Frances, you can be absolutely sure her royal advisors were watching it very closely. Mm -hmm. So now we wait and watch for the aftershocks. Ruff, thank you. President Biden is marking a pivotal moment in our nation's civil rights history with an executive order meant to make it easier for all Americans to vote. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. Tracy, 56 years after the Selma Bridge crossing, the fight for equality continues. Exactly. It was known as Bloody Sunday. And now on the anniversary of that event, President Biden wants to expand access uh, to voting rights for people all over this country, signing an executive order uh, that would expand voter registration, allow the federal government to help states and assist with registration and educating voters, and also improving access. That's a big part of this, uh, especially for people with disabilities, for those in the military and overseas voters and for those in custody, a number of different uh, groups that they're targeting with this. On the anniversary, 56th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, President Biden saying that this country can do more and do better when it comes to the right to vote. Today, on the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, I'm signing an executive order to make it easier for eligible voters to register to vote and improve access to voting. Every eligible voter should be able to vote and have that vote counted. Now, the vote counts also in Washington tomorrow when the House of Representatives again considers the American Rescue Plan. The Senate cleared it on Saturday but made some changes, so it's got to go back to the House, expected to pass and be signed into law by President Biden as early as tomorrow, likely with not one Republican vote. Philip? That help cannot come soon enough for millions of people. Tracy, thank you. Pope Francis wrapped up his historic visit to Iraq this morning. The Iraqi president bid him farewell at a ceremony just hours ago at the Baghdad airport before the pontiff flew back to Rome. The pope's tour of Iraq lasted four days. He even visited the city of Mosul, which had been bombed to rubble after becoming a capital for ISIS. Pope Francis used every stop of his trip to encourage peace and religious unity, while also delivering hope to the country's Christian minority. NBA All-Stars were in Atlanta for this year's games. No fans in the stands and still no defense on the court. Zion Williamson got his first All-Star game start and he would throw it down early. So would Dallas Mavericks phenom Luka Doncic on this one right down the lane uncontested. Steph Curry, well, he did what he does best, pulled up from just inside half court. Nothing but net. Team LeBron dominated most of the game. They needed to hit 170 points to end it. For about half court as well, Damian Lillard put it away for Team LeBron, the final 170 to 150 in hoisting the Kobe Bryant MVP award, Giannis Antetokounmpo. He did not miss one shot on Sunday. Earlier in the night, Steph Curry, he needed his last shot and every last one of them to come from behind and beat Mike Conley and win the three-point contest for the second time in his career. At halftime of the All-Star game, Anthony Simons gets pretty close to kissing the rim. He shies away because it almost hit his face, but he did win his first ever dunk contest on Sunday.
Brian DeChambeau needed a big win to secure a big day to secure a big win at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. DeChambeau was one of three players in the field on Sunday to shoot under par. It was enough to get the win, the eighth of his career in a nearly $1.7 million purse. Not a bad payday. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us this morning. Hey, Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. We're under a really quiet weather pattern. Pacific Northwest, we do have a developing storm system that will impact that area going into mid-afternoon. For the East Coast, though, we have high pressure that's all around. That's going to allow a ton of sunshine throughout your afternoon, but temperatures still below average. We're going to see this bubble of warm air make its way into the Great Lakes, then surge east by Tuesday. That's a look at the big weather start of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Jennifer Rosenhart and Dale Sievright are loving their new lives in Arizona. We just couldn't live. We just couldn't live like that anymore. The couple moved their family here from California last year, partly to escape the Golden State's pandemic oh, response, something they describe as a stifling culture of lockdown. We wanted to support businesses. We wanted to go to restaurants. And so coming to a state where it was like you can decide, you know, what you want to participate in was really important to us. Arizona leaders mostly opted to stay away from stringent lockdowns and never instituting a statewide mask mandate. Is this what you're making right now? Orvid Cutler says that's part of what allowed him to actually grow his business during the pandemic. Last year, he transitioned from a single employee food truck to a thriving brick and mortar restaurant. I know that here there was a lot of push towards outdoor dining, so there's been a lot of grants from the city and the state level to help build patios and get a seating. I mean, it's been amazing for us. But in neighboring New Mexico, where restrictions are much tighter, several say their business has nearly collapsed under the limitations. Bowling Alley owner Steve Mackey says a shutdown of the sport has cost him over a million dollars in revenue. Are you angry about this? I've been angry. This is inconceivable to me. We've got 27 and a half thousand square feet. We're a lot cleaner and a lot safer than most places that are open. Arizona is a populous state with fewer restrictions in place, and it ranks high in the number of cases and deaths per capita. Whereas New Mexico has a smaller population, but with a tighter set of COVID restrictions, ranks lower in the number of cases and deaths per capita. Some say Arizona's response led to a year of suffering inside its hospital system that ultimately forced Governor Ducey to put a pause on the state's reopening in late June. At times, we were leading the country and the world with COVID growth rate in terms of the rate of spread, as well as hospitalizations and deaths per capita, which is not a good distinction. Comparatively, New Mexico implemented some of the country's strongest measures with a strict statewide mask mandate and swift long limits on business capacity. I'm so proud of New Mexico and what we did. Lovelace Medical Center CMO Dr. Vesta Sandoval says the restrictions helped nearly alleviate caseloads. I personally would give New Mexico an A. We were able to work together and overcome so many obstacles. Back in Arizona, Governor Ducey just announced an abrupt end to capacity limits on all businesses, sparking concerns for frontline workers worried about yet another surge. There's no doubt in my mind that we could have saved more lives if we did more. Neighboring states divided on the balance between economic freedom and public health. One year later, both hoping the worst is over and their respective choices are now a matter of history. Steve Patterson, NBC News. Delta come a crude awakening. What's driving up oil prices this morning and when you could feel the pain at the pump. And moonstruck for the fifth time. Nicolas Cage wasn't leaving Las Vegas until he tied the knot again. In today's Quick Hits, Nicolas Cage announced he exchanged I do's for the fifth time. The actor married 26-year-old Rico Shibata last month in Las Vegas. Cage told People Magazine that he and his wife are very happy. Philanthropist Mackenzie Scott has reportedly remarried after her 2019 divorce from Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. According to the Wall Street Journal, Scott tied the knot with teacher Dan Jewett, who announced online he is committed to giving away his wealth with his wife. And Katie Couric is set to get behind the podium tonight for her stint guest hosting Jeopardy. The show shared some photos on set with Couric, who will be the first woman to guest host Jeopardy in his history. Right, get ready for a possible price spike at the gas pumps. This after crude raced above $70 a barrel for the first time in a year. Here to explain is CNBC's Karen Show. Hi, Karen. Good morning. 
Good morning, Francis. Uh, yes, get set for high prices at the pump. Oil prices have been rising all this year, actually adding about $18 per barrel since the start of the year, but also rallied aggressively in the month of March. You mentioned the spike through $70 on Brent and WTI also going with it. In the past week, we saw the national average price for regular gasoline jump to $2.71 per gallon, uh, a gallon. rather. That is up uh, 0.46 since the start uh, of this year. So an aggressive spike. A couple of factors at play here. The stimulus package that's been passed in the Senate that's been a catalyst for oil prices to move, but also geopolitical risk now entering the oil price. As you see, in Saudi Arabia uh, suffer an attack on its oil facilities. Houthi military has claimed responsibility for that. It's the latest in a series of attacks. So uh, just be prepared for that price to rise at the pump. Francis and Philip. Right. Thanks for the heads up, Karen. Thank you. When we return, Janessa is tracking a week-long warm-up. And bracing for unrest. We're live as Minneapolis prepares for the murder trial of, officer, of the officer filmed kneeling on George Floyd's neck. Starts now. Congress is working on the finishing touches of the coronavirus relief package this week. Means you could start getting money this month. States across the country are lifting coronavirus restrictions, but health officials say that's a dangerous move as variants spread. Minneapolis is on high alert on day one of the Derek Chauvin trial for the killing of George Floyd. Good morning to you. It's Monday, March the 8th. I'm Jerry Gish. Yeah, think about that, didn't you, Jerry? <laughs> I did. I didn't want to say the 8 end, which was actually in the there prompter. That didn't quite work for me. That wouldn't work, yeah. <laughs> By the way, I'm Lori. That's, and you know what? Today is International Women's Day. We'll so explain what that's all about as well. Let's go over to Tiffany Savona for the latest on the warming week that we're going to have, Tiff. We have some very nice warm weather in the forecast this upcoming work week. So our warming trend begins today, and then we'll continue through the rest of the week. But it's a cold start out there this morning. Look at the numbers. We're down into the teens and 20s, 16 in York. It's 21 in Harrisburg, 25 in Lancaster, 18 in Lebanon, and only 22 in Carlisle. So you need to bundle up this morning as temperatures will likely hover in the low and middle 20s for many spots. Milder today, high temperatures get around 50 degrees. That's much better than what we saw this weekend. And then partly cloudy this evening, light winds as temperatures drop down into the 40s. We have plenty of 60s in that 10-day forecast. We'll show it to you coming up in a bit. Back to you. All right, Tiffany, thank you. Americans could start seeing coronavirus relief checks soon. The $1.9 trillion relief package is headed back to the U.S. House for revisions and also final approval is set for tomorrow. Senate leaders are expected to push the bill forward with a Democratic majority vote. We're in the middle of tax filing season. That could slow down the process for doling out the checks this month. But just like the previous checks, if the IRS has your bank information on file, you'll get a direct deposit. Some may get paper checks or debit cards. Low income earners will have to register online or file a 2020 tax return. And the American Rescue Plan includes $1,400 direct payments to millions of Americans. Also extends unemployment benefits through September at $300 a week. Provides billions of dollars to state and local governments and boosts funding for COVID-19 vaccinations and testing. The bill's passing comes right before unemployment uh, benefits were set to expire on March 14th. Now workers will be covered until September. Everything in this package is designed to relieve the suffering and to meet the most, most urgent needs of the nation and put us in a better position to prevail. And opponents of the bill say it funnels money to unrelated policies, something to note the extra $300 in unemployment uh, people may be getting will end this weekend. Also new this morning, more tenants in the Susquehanna Valley will be able to apply for rental assistance today. That's also part of the Federal CARES Act. The application window for Lancaster County opens at 8 o'clock this morning. The window is already open for renters in Dauphin, Franklin and Adams County, and it could help cover rent for as many as 12 months with tenants in danger of being evicted given priority. To qualify, you have to have lost a job or income because of the pandemic, those at risk of housing instability or becoming homeless or fall under the income requirements also qualify. Applications have not yet opened for Cumberland and York counties. You can head to WGAL.com for more information. Back to you. Well, Lebanon County will explain the requirements to apply for the Hospitality Industry Recovery Program today. The county received $1.6 million of the $143 million the State General Assembly approved to keep the hospitality industry up and running amid capacity restrictions. Today's meeting will be held virtually by the Lebanon Economic Development Corporation. It starts at 2 o'clock this afternoon. An application to apply for grants will be posted to forwardtogetherlebanon.com by next Monday.
Well, a number of governors are easing COVID-19 restrictions. They're defending their decision as cases drop. Also hearing from top health experts who worry this may be a little too soon to do all of this, Brooke Conway has the latest. This week marks one year since the pandemic officially began, March 11th, 2020. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Restrictions put in place to limit the spread of the virus are easing up little by little. Some governors are starting by expanding capacity. That's the route Ohio and Michigan are taking. Because our numbers are low and our vaccinations are high, we feel like we can do this responsibly. With the vaccine, we're now on the offense. That's the great thing. But... <clears throat> In Ohio, we can't give up the defense. Other states are lifting mask mandates, including Mississippi, North Dakota, Iowa, Montana, and Texas. We have to get our economy rolling so that individuals can get back to work. But health experts worry it's too soon. We will be able to open up the country, open up the economy, but not at a time when we have circulating variants. The variant they're most concerned about is the one first spotted in the UK. It is doubling um, uh, in uh, every 10 days. It's spreading exponentially. Vaccines offer protection, but vaccinations take time. A CNN analysis shows 70% of the U.S. population could be fully vaccinated by the end of July and 85% by mid-September. Until then, health experts say we need to stick to what we know works. The only freedom a mask inhibits is the freedom of the virus to spread and kill people. I'm Britt Conway reporting. Well, today will be a tense day for the city of Minneapolis. And the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin gets underway for the killing of George Floyd that happened last year. And activists and civil rights groups, they held a silent march in Minneapolis yesterday afternoon. You can see this here. And they're demanding systemic changes to policing and policies. Jury selection gets underway today. Lawyers will be reviewing a series of questions for those jurors to answer. The questionnaire asks about their knowledge of and views about the case what they may have heard from the media, whether the person has a positive or negative view of the people involved. It also asks that the person participated in George Floyd protests, their views on Black Lives Matter, policing, and criminal justice. Video footage shows Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck for about eight minutes. He's charged with second-degree murder, manslaughter charges, and could be facing a third-degree murder charge as well. Well, President Joe Biden marked the anniversary of Bloody Sunday by signing an executive order to make voting easier. Now federal agencies have to specify how they will promote voter registration. The order expands mail-in voting and former felons will be able to vote and also make voter registration easier. This comes as 43 states, including swing states, are considering more than 200 new voter laws. Arizona is proposing the most changes. Pennsylvania has proposed quite a few changes as well. And new this morning, a series of explosions killed at least 20 people in the African country of Equatorial Guinea. The blast incur injured at least 600 others. And defense officials say a fire at a weapons depot in military buildings caused high caliber ammunitions to go off. The country's president said the fire may have been due to residents burning the the fields. The area was evacuated due to heavy smoke and also fumes. Police in Dolphin County are investigating a shooting that left one man seriously hurt. Police responded to a car accident on Division Street Saturday night. That's when they found a man suffering from a gunshot wound in the car. The victim was taken to the hospital. So to come on WGAL News 8 today, class is back in session for schools in Philadelphia. How they plan to keep students and teachers safe. But as we go to the break, let's take a look at last night's lottery numbers. We're back after this.